Parks London coming up. In the run-up to the London mayoral elections, we see what the politicians and the people have to say about London's transport. I think it's a good, I think it's really good compared to where I'm coming from. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Add air conditioning and make it cheaper, because as of right now, it does not slay as hard as it needs to, honestly. Good to have you with us. Hi, great to have you with us for the programme. I'm Samantha Simmons. In a minute, we'll be chatting to our MP guests of the day, Meg Hillier and Felicity Buchan. But first, well, in our last show before Easter, we spoke to mayoral candidate Zoe Garbutt from the Green Party. And this week, we meet the, meet the Lib Dem candidate who would be mayor, Rob Blackie. Just before we do that, here's an outline of Rob's vision for London. Coming home from work one evening, Rob Blackie was so violently mugged that surgeons had to repair his neck using titanium. It's this experience which is driving his number one mayoral priority, fixing the Met. With this, he prioritised getting the Met the funding he says it needs, get hundreds of officers back onto the front line and divert their activity towards tackling serious violent and sexual crime and away from stopping and searching people for drugs. For transport, Blackie's committed to improving outer London's connectivity, as well as prioritising accessibility and safety, and enabling retrospective applications to an extended ULES scrappage fund. He's also committed to tackling London's housing crisis. He claims he'd back new housing of all types, fight for renters' rights, and work with councils to deliver more homes more quickly. Finally, inspired by his environmentalist background, Blackie would push for more solar panels on people's roofs, an expanded electric car charging system and new allotments on spare land to boost biodiversity. Well, a warm welcome to the London Liberal Democrat mayoral candidate, Rob Blackie. Hi Rob, great to have you on the programme. Hi there. Thanks for so me. let's start with crime. You say you're going to prioritise funding for the Met, but most of that funding comes from central government, doesn't it? So how are you going to improve that picture? What are you going to do? Well, right now the Mayor is doing a really silly election year gimmick, which is to freeze fares on the tube for single fares, mainly used by tourists would redirect that money into the police and would use it to get police back on the front line. The Met right now has got about 6,000 police stuck in the back office. People who've been trained and skilled to be solving crimes, actually doing jobs like being press officers because we don't have enough civilian staff. Sometimes they've got a bad back or some problem like that. We think we can get them back on the front line and start but to solve more But then you need to crimes. backfill on those jobs. And that's what the money would be used for, for, for that backfilling. OK, you also say you'd focus on tackling serious crime. Which specific areas and how? Sexual offences in particular. There's been a collapse in the effectiveness of the Met on sexual offences in recent years. Compared to when the mayor took power, they are now catching roughly half as many sexual offenders as they were. And that's obviously absolutely critical crime, not just because we need justice for the victims, but also, people are often repeat offenders fair, so if we don't catch them first time, they'll go on to offend so how again. how would you do that? That's where, where the police we're, we're putting in will be uh, directed. So it's just about to, numbers? It's not just numbers, it's equipment. We have a ridiculous situation where there aren't even enough freezers for the forensic evidence. The case you reported for Met last year showed that sometimes cases are being lost because freezers are breaking down. I myself have been in a police station, seen a freezer so full of forensic samples but when it's opened up, the police can't find them. I've seen four police officers spend 15 minutes searching through a huge mound of little plastic bags to try and find the right forensic sample. That, that's no right way to run an effective So they don't have enough equipment, there aren't enough people. Yeah. Um, where else do you think they are possibly failing, perhaps in the types of crimes, would you say, that they are investigating? Well, I think it's very important that we fo focus police time on the crimes that matter. And right now, they're stopping and searching tens of thousands of young people a year for cannabis. I don't think anyone really thinks that should be a priority compared to more serious crimes. We can redirect that time and get people investigating the, times of, uh, the crimes that matter to people. OK, let's talk about more, more about transport. You criticise the mayor for freezing fares yeah. uh, for the next few months at least. What would you specifically do for people in outer London to improve their transport networks? We think we can get a long-term deal for transport in London where we can build new tra train lines and tube lines, but we can only do that if we run transport for London's 
uh, finances responsibly. Now, the mayor in the last eight years has taken well over a billion pounds out of transport for London. And when you do that, the system starts to creak. So it's hard to borrow the money to build new tu tube and train lines in outer London. But also, he's had to cut buses and he hasn't been maintaining the tube properly. And if you've been on a tube that's broken down, that's possibly because the tube hasn't been maintained properly. I'm sure he'd uh, disagree with a lot of what you just said. I'm sure he uh, will. We will be talking yeah. to him hopefully in a couple of weeks about all of that. But ULAS, what would you do about that? Well, the first phase of ULAS was a success because people had plenty of time to adapt. The second phase was much more controversial because people only had a few months to adapt. And of course, in outer London, it's harder to adapt because public transport's just not quite as good. Now, it's happened. Uh, most people with cars have adapted, but some of the tradespeople who have vans, maybe a plumber or carpenter, are still struggling with that. So we've said we'll try and make the, scheme, the scrappage scheme better to help them to adapt to the US. But you wouldn't scrap the scheme. No. Do you believe that it's working in terms of improving air quality in outer London? A bit. Probably not as much as, as inner London, because inner London is more built up, so the polluted air builds up more quickly, but it is having some impact. Housing. How would you go about building the houses that... Londoners of all types need, whether it's flats, uh, council houses, houses themselves? So there's a huge housing crisis in London. You know, everyone young you talk to, even more middle-aged people now, often are paying huge amounts of rent in London. And that's because we've had a million more people come into our city in the last 15 years. We haven't built the houses. We've got to build a lot more housing. That means uh, London-owned development companies. We can build our own houses, which allows us to do it faster and without complex negotiations with private developers. Again, how are you going to pay for it? Well, that's actually using money that would already exist, but using it more efficiently. And with the um, uh, way of private housing right now, the mayor is missing all of his private housing targets. That's because he makes it so incredibly hard to build a house. Right now, you have to jump through 70 hoops if you're going to build so a house. So you get rid of red tape? Well, we'd, re we'd reduce them to try and make it faster to build houses, because right now we have that urgent housing crisis. What about renters? How are you going to improve the situation for them, many of whom are being priced out of the market and moving away from London as a that, That's why building houses is very important, because that, that will help. Time. Uh, it that does take time. It does take time, you're right. And in the meantime, people can't afford yeah. the rent. Yeah. Well, we also need to protect from, from bad landlords. And one of the things we've said is we'll provide a pot of money for them, people to take legal action when they're mistreated by landlords. Because it's a, you know, it's a seller's market right now in London, uh, often tenants are having a very bad time. OK, Rob, what's your one-line pitch to voters? I'm, go I'm going to fix the Met and cut crime in London. OK, very good. It really was one line. Really great to see you. Thank see. you very Thank much you. for coming in. Well, next week, we'll be talking to the Conservative candidate, Susan Hall. And you can see a full list of all the candidates standing in the mayoral elections on the BBC website. The address is on your screen right now. Well, one certain hot-button issue in May the second elections is one we just touched on, transport. What do Londoners want to see done on getting London's transport network moving efficiently and providing a reliable service? Well, we went to find out. I'd say some lines are reliable, like Victoria Line, we love, because, you know, she's always reliable. Other lines, yeah, they're very hit or miss, I'd say. But when it does work, it's fabulous. So. I think it's a good, I think it's really good compared to where I'm coming from, it's, it's awesome. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, you know what I mean? I, I personally find it extremely good, uh, but it's too expensive and I think that's because our current mayor um, gives in too easily to the trade unions and so they get their pay rises. Uh, perhaps above their skills in some cases. I would never drive in London. Oh, no. <laughs> Not, I don't even consider it. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Um, I think it's just so super busy and congested. Um, I think I'd be too nervous. Buses, uh, improve the buses. Uh, trains, make them a lot cheaper. I'm over 66. I'm pensionary. I have the free pass. Before uh, COVID, I could get the bus any time, and now it's after nine. I'm very annoyed for this. Personally, I, I saw Sadiq Khan implemented all the, these new uh, names to a bunch of different lines, which seemed to me to just be quite typical of his policy. Add air conditioning and make it cheaper, because as of right now, it does not slay as hard as it needs to, honestly. Well, real concerns there about London's transport system. So what are the mayoral candidates going to do about it? Should they get the keys to City Hall? Our reporter Jessica Ewart went to meet them.
Thank you very much. So the first thing I would do on the very first day that I was Mayor of London, I would stop the ULES expansion, without doubt, no question. Journeys in London are necessary. People don't just go out and joyride in, in, in London for no reason. We've all got to get from A to B. If you're disabled, very often you will be in a vehicle. One of the things I've absolutely promised is that I would put CCTV in every underground carriage because that would, if people that were up to no good knew that they were being watched and that it was being recorded, I think that would stop an awful lot, hopefully eliminate the amount of um, sexual har harassment we get on uh, the underground. We've seen recently knives on the underground. Uh, the other thing that is not fair is this London paper mile. Now he's now saying, oh, I wouldn't bring it in. But it's rubbish. He said he would never bring in the Euler's expansion. And of course he did. So he can't be trusted on that. Your Conservative opponent has questioned your position on it. I've made it quite clear, as long as I'm mayor, there'll be no paper mile. In fact, I wrote to the commissioner saying it quite clear to him. And Londoners should worry about a Conservative candidate willing to spread lies, misinformation. My first commitment is to keep fares as low as possible, particularly during this cost of living crisis. I'm really proud to have introduced the Hopper bus fare, which means unlimited bus and tram travel within an hour. My second commitment is to massively increase uh, bus uh, kilometres across uh, our city. I'm really proud over the last year alone, uh, we've increased by more than a million bus kilometres uh, the service is in outer London. If I'm re-elected, there'll be a massive increase in buses across uh, London, particularly outer London, but also we'll introduce a second Superloop Express uh, service, the Baker Loop. And my, my third uh, pledge to Londoners is to make sure our public transport improves uh, even more. Uh, we're going to invest in new trains on many of our uh, lines. We'll be cutting bus waiting times massively improving walking and cycling. I'm committing to reinstating the free tra travel for older people so they can get out in about 24 hours a day. We have an ambition for making a one flat fare for the whole city. What would that one flat fare look like? It's been estimated to cost about 450 million, so it's something that we'd have to work with government to get that funding for, but we're talking about maybe bringing it in on the DLR first. So I'm proposing a consultation with Londoners to make our road user charging fairer. Also making sure we're ded dedicating some of our transport routes like the Hammersmith Bridge, permanently designating that to walking, wheeling and cycling and also repurposing things like the Silvertown Tunnel. We need to build new tube and train lines so that people in outer London can get around more easily. We can do this by getting a long-term funding agreement with national government to get building again. Are there any particular parts of London where you would see a new tube station put? Well, we're very interested in make, making, bringing uh, maybe a tram or overground to Sutton. I would protect buses from being cut any further. Under the mayor, bus routes have been cut by 22 million miles. I'm going to maintain the tube properly. Right now, people are very frustrated by tubes breaking down, you know, particularly on things like the central line. And the first thing I'm going to do on the first day I walk in this, I'm going to shut down Ulez right across the whole of the city. It's all going. Plus LTNs, 20 mile an hour limits, speed bumps, pinch points, excessively wide cycle lanes, they're all going. I want to do a root and branch analysis, economic analysis of how TfL operates. There's 1,100 staff working in under study Karma, which most of them are in TfL, earning £100,000 a year or more. There's even one earning three to 400,000. That cannot be justified. That's just one thing. But there's also things like all the virtual signalling policies he's putting in, millions into various things like renaming stations. That's all going to go. Well, Felicity, Meg, welcome to you both. Felicity, let's start with you, Les. Would you scrap it? Well, Susan Hall, our excellent candidate, has been very clear that on day one she will scrap the extension of the ULES into outer London because in outer London it really doesn't work because of the lack of public transport alternatives. So she's been very clear on that. But one thing I want to say is that I think the current Mayor of London's performance on transport has been woeful. And if there are two 
complaints that I get on the doorstep, it is transport and it is crime, both of which he is responsible for. If you look at strikes on the tube, we've had 140 days of strikes. If you compare that to Boris Johnson over an equivalent time period, there were 35 days of strikes. And this is from the Mayor of London, who when he was first elected, promised zero days of strikes. And what is he doing? He's throwing 30 million pounds to his trade union buddies to try and prevent strikes, but actually it's encouraging strikes. So, and you've also got to think that central government has given TfL, the Mayor of London, 6.6 .6 billion pounds, huge amount of money during COVID, okay. and yet the performance is very, very poor. And just one quick point, in my constituency, two okay. tube stations are closing erratically because they don't have staff. So people okay. turn up and Holland okay. Park tube station is closed. Okay, uh, Meg, lots of points to respond mm -hmm. to that. I do want to ask you about you, Les, though. The science when it comes to the expansion isn't going to helpfully be revealed until after the election. If it shows um, that it is having a negligible effect, is it right to scrap it then, the extension? Well, let's be clear, um, ULES um, will apply to only 95% of vehicles are ULES compliant. So only five, just under 5% of vehicles would actually have to change and there is a very generous scrappage scheme to pay for that and it's a silent killer you know back in victorian days we could smell the pollution in the 50s and 60s you could see it now it's invisible but it is killing people and so it's really important that it's tackled and this mayor has been really groundbreaking and world leading on trying to tackle air quality yeah, but Felicity said he's been woefully inadequate when it comes to uh, TfL and they've had to have mm. six handouts from the government. Well, let me be clear. I mean, the, this is the only major transport system in the world that is funded entirely from fares. When the fares collapsed during COVID, as with other parts of the system, of course, the central exchequer ch uh, chipped in. And that's absolutely essential to keep it running for our emergency services workers and the crucial people who had to get to, to the office. But that's, that's, that is not a failure of the mayor. That is because of COVID. But even even with, with COVID, we've managed to see um, the Elizabeth Line built, the Northern Line extension, the Night Tube introduced, the Fair Freeze. I mean, there was a list of really good projects that was this Mayor of London has delivered for Londoners on transport. And with the cost of living crisis as it is, that freeze on fares is really critical. Does the government, whatever mm -hmm. colour it is next time around, need to provide a, a longer term solution to TfL's finances? Well, I just want to come back on that point because government is making capital contributions towards TfL government has just announced an additional 250 million pounds for the Piccadilly line for new carriages. But so these are ad hoc uh, and mounts aren't they? There isn't actually a long-term plan. TfL needs to be able to run itself and if Susan Hall is elected as the Mayor of London, she will be able to run TfL properly. Well, and that's what we all need. But if you look at the maths, if she, does, if she doesn't take any, any of the extra money that may occasionally be available from government, then it would mean further cuts to other services like the buses. Because actually, Transport for London is on a model funded by fares. So it is really important to keep passenger numbers up. And that's where things like the lower fares help, because it keeps people in the habit of using public transport. And what's great about what Sadiq Khan's doing is he's now extending public transport the bus services extended further and out of London we need to change the habits the first mayor of London made transport free for children that generation has grown up with the habit of using public transport and we need to try seeing a, a step change part of that is providing better services well, how, when how is Susan to yes. London Felicity mm. what is Susan Hall offering well, let me just come back on the point as to how does Susan Hall balance the books. She does it by stopping wasting money, whether it's throwing money to the trade unions to try and stop them from striking, whether well, it's how all... Well, stops the strikes then? What's her solution? Because you need to have a good, sensible relationship with the trade unions. But whenever you throw money to one trade union, it incentivizes the others to come out and strike. It's just human nature. So you you need to have a professional relationship with the trade unions. And in terms of what Susan is doing for Outer London, I think that the vast majority of residents in Outer London would say that Susan is representing their interests. And this is one thing that I see with Sadiq Khan, that he does not care about what residents say. It's all motivated by ideology and by his well, profile. Does I think he clean listen air. to people enough? Well, I think clean air 
mayor is a really critical thing. And one of the whole s points of the system of having an elected mayor is that they are empowered to make difficult decisions that will be of a long-term benefit to our city. And cleaning up our air is critical. Other people around the world are looking at what Sadiq Khan is doing to see mm. if they can learn from this. And yes, there's some pain in the short term, but that is well supported through the scrappage scheme. And there's a lot of really hairs being set running by the Conservative candidate to say this is affecting everybody. It is you know, over 95% of vehicles in London are ULES compliant. Mm. So it's a small number Critics. relatively. Critics have accused Sadiq Khan of being anti-car, hasn't haven't they? Would you agree that he is anti-motorist? No, I think in that, in London we will need we need people in vans and 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 and, and, uh, and cars to, that will often have to use that for work because of their jobs. But also, if you look in certain parts of London, my own borough in Hackney, for example, we are pioneering um, on electric vehicles for for certain services like the council runs, but also pedal power where that's appropriate. And that's not appropriate for everybody, and you still need people to be able to use their vehicles to get to work where that's appropriate, um, and that's that's important. But it's not, you know, not at the cost of clean air. I don't think that Sadiq Khan does listen to residents. I've got an example in my constituency that he is proposing to put a cycle lane into Holland Park Avenue roundabout when there are already two cycle lanes. It's going to cause huge congestion backing up all the way into the arterial roads. I, within two or three days, got 3,000 signatures on a petition, and I would ask him to listen to what residents are saying in Holland Park. Just very briefly, are there too many cycle lanes, do you think, that you see when you're uh, travelling around London? I know you cycle as well, so you're probably yeah, well, in favour. I, 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 cycle, I cycle, but I, I also cycle, on, I cycle with other traffic. But actually, if you're clever about how you do it, as my borough in Hackney has done over the years, you, you can make cycle routes which aren't cycle lanes on roads so there's an awful lot of work that can be done and but some of those cycle routes into central London have made a transformation uh, for the opportunity to keep London clean and also get cyclists people thinking about using their bike instead of public transport or their car all right thank you now it is not just the mayor of London people will be voting for on May the 2nd they'll also be voting for the London Assembly so what exactly does the Assembly do Johnny Harvey explains the London Assembly, like the Mayor of London, is based here at City Hall in the Royal Docks, in a building known as the Crystal. It's made up of 25 members. 14 come from borough constituencies, while the other 11 are elected as London-wide representatives. Put simply, the job of the London Assembly is to hold the Mayor of London to account. To do this, there are currently 12 cross-party committees which scrutinise policies, and Assembly members can also challenge the Mayor at Mayor's Question Time, which takes place 10 times a year. But its main power comes in its ability to veto the mayor's budget. For this, though, the Assembly requires a two-thirds majority. This has never been achieved, and so the veto hasn't occurred since the Assembly was founded in the year 2000. So how worthwhile is the London Assembly? In December, its own oversight committee called for its powers to be strengthened, and I spoke to some current Assembly members to learn more. The Mayor and London Assembly were created at the start of devolution across the country, and I think people think it's a done deal, and actually we need far more powers for London, for the Mayor and the London Assembly. So the Assembly really has very limited powers. I would like it to be able to amend the Mayor's strategies and budgets with a simple majority, not a two-thirds majority. I would also like there to be a power to call in mayoral decisions. I think people find it astonishing. The mayor can make a huge decision and we can't do anything about it. So I think one of the powers that needs to come to the Assembly, I think we can also talk about um, the powers over certain of the mayor's strategies and those areas um, internally to the Greater London Authority, but externally, I think, giving the Assembly more powers over some of these sort of unelected bodies that people don't even really know are there, I think that would be a really good thing. And then there's some bodies that everybody knows about. Thames Water, for example. Members from the Conservative Party have been calling for these bigger devolution powers from the time of Boris Johnson. So it's something that we are really passionate about is the, the need for the Assembly to have more powers and be that a mayor of any colour, um, you know, any political colour, you're, you're going to need a mayor that can work cross-party because they're going to have to work really closely with the government as well. And so to get the best deal for London, we need to all kind of be on as much on the same page as possible as we can, showing that decisions are being properly scrutinised, coming to consensus and compromise where we can in order to get a really good deal from London. One of the things that our report from the Oversight Committee asked for was that the 
uh, the assembly had the power to um, veto the uh, the mayor's police and crime plan, and obviously policing and trust and confidence in the police has been such a huge issue over these recent years with everything that's come out through the Casey review and the recent Angelini um, inquiry. There's a huge job to rebuild trust and confidence in the police. So once the dust settles, how will the assembly work with whomever is elected mayor on May the 2nd? Will they be a help? or a hindrance? And will we see an extension of their powers to sufficiently challenge the winner? Well, Meg, you were a London Assembly member when it was first founded. Did you experience any issues with holding the then mayor, Ken Livingston, to account? Well, what was interesting is because Ken Livingston was an independent mayor, of course, at the beginning, and there were 25 Assembly members. So we found ourselves working quite closely together because we were none of us in his party. Um, but I think you can, get, you can get into interesting party politics with only 25 Assembly members if you gave more powers. But what I found is, and I chaired a number of scrutiny committees, and we were able to get witnesses whenever we wanted. No one would refuse to come. Uh, so there's, I think you, know, you can have a discussion about this, but I think the priority after an election, probably delivering on some of the things that need to be delivered rather than constitutional change but this was a well thought through act of parliament that set up one of the biggest ever acts of parliament to set up city hall to try and drive plurality and i think as a, someone who scrutinizes things now in parliament you, you have an awful lot of power as a scrutineer and influence if you use it well and use it effectively apart from a two-thirds majority is needed isn't it yes and but, but actually we elect the mayor obstacle but we elect the mayor the mayor is elected with a very big personal mandate for a reason to make difficult decisions um, that affect londoners and so actually if, if they if they're having to trim all the time to an assembly you could see some perverse outcomes from that so I think that that two-thirds majority is not unreasonable actually um, but I do think that there are areas I think you know for instance looking at Thames Water certainly I think that's something the assembly can mm. currently do um, but there are areas that probably could be looked at after 25 years which will you know next year will be the 25th anniversary of the assembly. Felicity what's your view on the assembly? So I do believe that scrutiny is very important as is accountability and transparency of course there is the ultimate ultimate scrutiny and that comes at the ballot box so if you're not happy with the current mayor of London vote Susan Hall on May the 2nd but my view is we shouldn't come to any rash judgments yes we could sh should consider whether we've got the most appropriate scrutiny but that is the job of the assembly it is to scrutinize the mayor as opposed to be the executive function mm -hmm. And it's stronger than other mayors and with, who don't have the same accountability structures in the other devolved systems. Felicity, would you like to see its remit extended for, for the mayor for the assembly to have more powers? I think at this stage, what we need to have is a mayor who is performing well for London. I know, but let's talk about the assembly. Yes. We, we, know, we know you back Susan Hall. We know you <laughs> think she's going to be the best candidate, but let's talk about how the assembly functions yes. and whether there should be more powers for the assembly members and for the mayor, whoever it may be. I think the first step is to make sure that the scrutiny is being done at the highest level, and that's what I would like to focus on. Uh, yeah, the uh, Meg, the GLA Oversight Committee, they've called specifically for more fiscal devolution because at the moment they only have control over council tax. They say that would enable stronger innovation. Do you agree? Well, I think it's an, an interesting one that the, the mayor has very little tax raising powers. It is that little bit of council tax. But I think it is a very big debate to start talking about major changes to the tax system. So I'm sure their contributions will be heard if this ever is discussed nationally. But I think it is a big step. Um, but both our parties have actually committed to devolution. I think our, our model is, is better and, and wanting to devolve more but I think if those constitutional changes happen over the next parliament or two then there may be a discussion but there is absolutely no proposal from the Labour Party at this stage at all um, to have any further tax raising powers for the Mayor of London. And do you think devolution is working then? Has, has it been a, a, a good experiment? We've had nearly a quarter of a century of it so far. Do you think it's been a success? Yes, government is very much so behind devolution across England. And obviously we've got the devolved legislatures in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So we are supportive okay. of devolution. Thank you so much. That is all we have time for this week. My thanks to Meg and to Felicity. A reminder to our viewers, the deadline for registering to vote is midnight on Tuesday so don't forget if you haven't done so already I do hope you can join us again next week when I'll be talking to Susan Hall bye for now